Crouch. Bind. Set. Joe presents the House of Rugby together with Guinness. Ladies and gents, we go again. Welcome to House of Rugby, brought to you by Joe together with our very good friends at Guinness. I think it's fair to say we are on a hot streak right now. Legend after legend, hero after hero joining us week by week. Um, last week we had England's second highest cap player of all time in the men's game, and that, of course, Ben Young's 99 not out for him. Uh, this week it is a very warm welcome to the fire pussy himself. It is... <laughs> High five all round. Oh, God, here we go. To the editor, <laughs> England winger and fullback, part time flanker, Mr. Jack Noel. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's wrong with that. Do you want to explain? No. <laughs> no. How are you? Looking well. Show us underneath the Red Bull cap. We've had a little bit of time on the hair as well. Looking good. Looking Flip good. Neck. Skunk looks absolutely impeccable. Well, I shaved it all off. Uh, Shaved it all off, shaved the milk in, and then dyed it the other day. So I don't know what's going on. I had a beard. I looked a bit like Hask. Awful. Um, so then I've got the tash. Yeah. <laughs> You've gone with the Urquhart uh, Borrow point-ups as well. Are you it's waxing that? Is, is that just a natural little... Um... This is natural grease. Probably a bit of food from earlier. Lovely. <laughs> but, yeah, in case you get hungry. How are you? What's keeping you busy? What, what are you doing? How, you know, what's, what's in the to-do list at the moment? Um... A bit like everyone else, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I set myself a task that I was going to pressure wash on my whole fence in my garden and paint it. I've done half a job. Um, and I did that about four weeks ago and I've not continued. Yeah. <laughs> I started off so well. Um, I was lucky enough to get a gym built in my garage uh, about three weeks before all this shit happened and kicked off. So that was actually pretty good timing. Um, yeah. So I've, I've are you in there a lot? Or are you just admiring I'm home it? avoidance, mate. I'm a wow. severe home avoidance. Right. So I go over there, I spend about five, try and spend about five hours a day in there, to be honest. <laughs> hey. No, nah, I'm not that bad. I'm not that bad. But His missus it, is going to listen to this and be like, yeah. you said you're working out. You said Eddie Jones had told you to do that stuff. You're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not that bad. It's just I've, I've realized what it's like to be a full-time parent and a full-time dad, and it's, it's chaos. Honestly, I say to my missus all the time that you don't know what I go through in a day. You don't know what I do at training. You don't know how hard it is to come home then and start having to be a dad. My God, her being a full-time mum the whole time at home by herself, I take my hat off to her after this because I'm knackered just looking after Nori. And does she quietly, your missus, just quietly get on with it and let you do what you do or do you have to um, pay it back in? <laughs> no, she does do I gave her the big spiel about, at the start of this, I was like, look, babe, I, I could be at the club working seven hours a day but instead, I'm next door. I'm in my gym here. I can come home in between. So just think how lucky you are that I'm next door. Sounds very familiar. It's all about the Hask train, that doesn't it? You're, either on or you're off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, if I, the problem is, is that Chloe would never. If I disappeared the garage for five hours, I give it, I give it thirty minutes before his little face peeked around, going, "What are you yeah. doing? I find yeah. you." I'm like, "Please go away." I'm in my office. No, she goes because she knows all that working out. She's like, "Now nah, you've been training for an hour. What else are you doing?" Um, <laughs> more fitness you're a liar get out and that'll be it she knows you That's too well exactly it mate how is how is the body have you has it been quite nice to have a bit of downtime because you you had you had your ankle problems didn't you is that clearing yeah. up is it rehabbing it is. where are you at with it I'm, a, I'm actually feeling really really good my ankle is still pretty bad um, obviously I had that injury in the final um, yeah where I kind of got bent over backwards and I was chewing on my own feet but yeah I can't you know, I was desperate to be involved in the World Cup. Obviously, it didn't go to plan of what I wanted to do personally. Uh, but I just felt lucky enough to be there. Um, I wasn't I wasn't right by no means when I came back. Um, but I said to Baxter and Exeter, I just wanted to play. Um, I was in a good enough position to play. Um, but every single time I'd get tackled funny or I'd roll it, uh, I'd just be getting the same pain. So I kind of got to a certain stage where it was unlucky enough for me. It was just four Six Nations. And I was like, right, I need to get this done. Um so I almost had it re-opt, uh, cleaned out, uh, had 40 minutes off the bench against Bath, and then this happened, so I've had like extra time off, to be honest. But it's not, it's not too bad. Like, I had a lot, a lot of rugby players had niggles. You know, my shoulders yeah. were bad, my knees were bad, but I'm actually feeling really, really good at the moment until love- the first game. Yeah, and that's how you get knocked back into people. Yeah. I love the fact you call your head coach Baxter. Is that just a sort of an informal kind of... Uh, is that how you roll down Southwest? I would call him Sir Malad or Your Honour. You, have you got permission to do that? I don't know. I've spent so much time away from the club that I've kind of forgotten. Maybe it's just something... Yeah, you might be spending a lot more if you're that informal with the guy who makes the, makes the big decisions. Um, it's Jack. 
Sorry, it's like it's like when we heard um, we heard from uh, Matt Kitto when uh, Eddie Jones got his first gave this player his first opportunity, and the guy who picked up the phone and went, "Thanks so much, champ." And Eddie went, "Champ, champ, do you fucking respect anyone?" And so I can laugh if you go in Baxter. How are you? Right, right, you're a boy. I give a body shot, and he's like. Fuck off. Backhand, yeah, 100%. Yeah. That's what it would be like. I, I'm, I'm teleported into Anchorman because Bax is the name of the dog. He's taking yeah. care of a PC. Um, so what else? What is, have you been doing? You've been doing a bit of gaming. You got schooled by Mako at FIFA. Is oh, that right? Mako wasn't even... Mako was a bad one because I've played Mako a lot on camp uh, and he always beats me. But he's not been too bad after. I actually played against, against uh, an EA gamer uh, that represents Man City. Um I don't want to go too much into this, but I, I got absolutely spanked by him, and that was even more. Like in the end, he was doing tricks in the box and stuff. I think it was six 0 at half time. Um, um, so the Mako one was embarrassing, but this one was. I think he's got thousands of followers in there watching. So that was pretty bad for me as well. Was that was that quite? I mean, that's that's quite intense stuff. And just from a sort of a complete outsider's point of view, from um, I was remember at Sky, we were getting ten, fifteen thousand viewers for a Pro fourteen game on a good day. And the EA gaming that they were streaming was getting half a million views. I mean, it is, for those that don't really follow it, an enormous playground. Well, how does that compare, stepping into the EA sports arena to lacing up your boots and doing what you do as a day job? Are you quite nervous? Are you quite up for it? Are you quite confident? School? I was, ve- I was, very, I was very, very nervous. Like, he, he was going on to it. He, he was actually, I spoke to him the day before I played him, and he was saying that he, was play, he played against Sergio Aguero the night before. <clears throat> and I was like, Right, so you're playing against Aguero one day, then you're playing against me the next day. Like it's a bit, bit surreal, but that is literally their life. And I think especially with everything that's going on at the moment, you just see the get their, their gaming streaming's going up. There's more and more people watching, and they're getting paid more and more money. There's more and more competitions that they're taking part in. Um, so was, I thought it was just you know really good guys sat in front of their Xbox playing PlayStation, really. Um, but but it's not like that at all. <laughs> but but you it's know um, time, but... you know where uh, Jackson good company because. Uh, Luke Cowandicki was number one in the world at call a specific part of Call of Duty. Number one in the world. Like, do you know how long you have to play that? Like, I I, I never played Xbox. I've got an Xbox, right? And I just because I, I got one, and I uh, I dusted it off, right? And I thought, do you know what? I'm trying to make myself busy here, but I'm going to treat myself. So I start. I bought Call of, um bought the new Call of Duty. I like doing the missions because every time I go on the, the, the multiplayer, I just get killed. Like, as soon as I turn, I get killed, killed, killed. I'm, like, fiddling with, like, sensitivity settings. Like, I'm trying to do really well. And just and then you put the headset on, and all these American kids are, like, getting into you. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> I will fly to America, and I will kill you and your family. And they're like, ah. they're like, fuck off, mate. You're like, oh, my God. <laughs> I, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. But Cal was, was number it, one though. in the world. It was, mate. It was. I didn't see him for about over a week. I reckon. Wow. He would literally come in from training. He would come to training. So say we started at eight. He'd been in at eight. By the time I'd left the field, he had already been in, showered, changed. Um, And then he only lives two doors down from me. I would then, I would then drive past, look in his window and he'd be on his Xbox playing. Like he'd be gone and he'd be on there till four or five in the morning. Uh, Then go sleep for like two, three hours back to training. And then when he would be sleeping, the Americans would be playing and they'd be taking over him. So he just kept, they kept leapfrogging each other. Um, and he'd still be playing at the weekend and he'd still be carving up. And I'm just like, if I don't get nine hours sleep, I'm fucked. This guy's surviving off three hours a day and he's number one in the world at Call of Duty. He don't give a shit about rugby. <laughs> so I was going to say, genuine question. Is he more proud of his achievements in Call of Duty or his England caps? Oh, See, the silence, the silence says yeah. it all. I see you got to think about it. Obviously, he loves, yeah, he loves the fact he's played for England and stuff. But honestly, you talk to him about gaming. The first thing you'll bring up is, yeah, number one in the world at Call of Duty, Search and Destroy at one stage. That's literally, he loves it. Absolutely <laughs> it's loves like it. a business card. You know what? I, I, I started playing um, Grand Theft Auto. That's my, my favourite oh game. My right, I, I finished it. that at university. Uh, what, Vice City? I got a degree. I got, yeah, I got a degree in Vice City. Um, Max Payne. Um, all those, all those ones. I, I, yeah, finished. So I, I, so I got. So I love. I, love, I don't like it, like shooting games. Yes, 
first person and and uh, Grand Theft Auto. So I got Grand Theft Auto Five, and I was pl- I was playing it. And obviously, every time Chloe walks in the room, I was always in a strip club. <laughs> and it's actually, there's a- um, <laughs> amazing scenes. So you got school by Mako. Are you, are you? I mean, are you spending a bit of time doing it, is, or are you kind of? No, no I'm, I'm not, I, I play a little bit of FIFA. I'm more on the Fortnite bandwagon at the moment. Yeah, um, going well. Big- these guys, uh, these, the guys who make it get paid a fortune, don't they? Yeah, they did a they did a um a Fortnite World Cup last year, I think it was the first one. The yeah. kid was like sixteen; he won thirty million. Right, ridiculous, mate. That just shows how much they make, and the game's free. The game's free to download, but people buy like costumes and stuff, and that's how they spend their money. It's mental, wow. mate. Mental. I bet you both his shoulders and his ankle works as well. Thirty million ba- in the bank, and yeah, um, not, and great, not, work. not great with girls though, or talking to people, or hygiene probably, <laughs> or living in the house. But with thirty million, you can buy all that. Doesn't matter. It's amazing exactly. how popular we come with a bit of cash. Um, and what are you watching? Any good telly? You're watching Last Dance oh, at the moment. How's that working mate, out for you? I'm, I'm watching that. My goodness gracious me! The the Last Dance is single handedly the best. Uh, sports documentary I have ever, ever watched. Like, I obviously was growing up in the 90s. I was aware of Michael Jordan. I knew he was a legend. I remember him going to basketball, but it was a lot of my childhood was like me on a mountain bike coming past and seeing things on the TV in between me dressing as an army soldier and running outside. Like I never really sat still long enough to concentrate on sport. I wasn't really into sport until about 14 or 15. And just his competitive spirit, like it's interesting. I can see the guys in my career who I've played with, who are, who have similar mentalities, which was interesting. Chloe was asking me, like, who, who in rugby would have been hit like him driving the standards? Um, you know, it was just, he's just, what a hero. And I love, I love how he just rolls a cigar. Like, I, you know, I, I like a little cigar from time to time. And I just thought, <laughs> he's made it cool. I was like, okay, okay, it's okay. You know, he's just, just the, the, the determination, the man behind the legend, the, the way it's shot, the montages, you know, Dennis Rodman, you know, uh, Scotty Pippen, just how they all work together. I may, it's the best thing I've ever watched and anyone needs to watch it. And do you know what? It's like inspired me to be better at everything. I'm like, right, work hard. I train the house down in the gym today. Chloe's like working even harder. I'm, you know, I'm practicing everything more because it just shows, you know, hard work, determination and the fact that he had the most talent of anyone I've ever seen. Flipping it, keeps talented. Ridiculous. Have you watched it, Jack? I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm up to date of it at the moment. It is class. It's phenomenal to watch. Um, I haven't started it, but it's definitely is on the to-do list. Have we covered anything else off? Watched anything else? Any other bits and bobs? Mate, I'm a, I'm a full-time dad. I don't have time to catch to watch films, do I? How you know is I mean? that? You, you, it's quite funny chatting before we came on. You've got a full-time dad and you've got another one on the way. Double trouble. How much longer have. have you got to go? <clears throat> um, we're five weeks, five weeks left now we are. Um, do you so know yeah, what you're having good. a second time round? No. Nope. We don't know. We didn't find out with Nori the first time around. Uh, I wanted a girl the first time. I was lucky. Uh, I've got a girl. This time I would like a boy. But obviously everything goes well, but I would like a boy. I'm not going to lie. Um, but yeah, yeah. we've got five weeks Five weeks to wait now and then we find out. And suddenly your five hours in the gym might start going up to five, six, seven, eight, <laughs> ten, twelve, twenty, twenty-three and a half. Um, good luck with that. Obviously, that is that is incredibly exciting news and, and perfect time to take delivery with very little else to do. Um, and what are the, how are the club looking after you? What, I mean, what, what is Baxter telling you on a day to day basis that he wants from you? Uh, Rob Baxter is uh, he's we're not he's obviously speaking to us time and time to get like a few times when he gets the updates and stuff. But in terms of us, just really of our physios, our conditioners. You know, obviously we can't see any of them. Um, but they're giving us like our individual programs. They are writing us out. They are writing weights programs for us. But I quite like writing my own weights programs. I don't like doing anything under ten reps, uh, as Hask found out a couple of summers ago. Um, Go on, that needs well, explanation. Should, no, he's a machine. He's, well, he's strictly hypertrophy. Yeah, I mean, like Jack's, uh, you know, obviously an incredible athlete and an amazing player. But it, I remember just n- noticing that. Whenever I was like doing extra bits in the gym or doing something else, though Jack always would be there. I'd be doing like mobility. <laughs> Jack would just be there, like if he could get away with it in the summer, a shirt off, right, full te- of tats out, just <laughs> like I, I, just full <clears throat> hypertrophy all the time, it's like you know, ten to twelve reps, just every day. And I was like, mate, he is so hungry for the weights. He's like a you're a weights machine. You absolutely no, I love them. I love them. I'm in my element at the moment because I've got no conditioners telling me to do four, six reps. I'm just like, they're sending me through my program and I'm like, yeah, I'll do that. No worries. <laughs> Yesterday I did 20, 20 reps of front squat 
Uh, and I did five sets of it, mate. And I was in my element. I was nearly sick outside the gym, but it was brilliant. I was like, 20 reps. I'm doing 20 reps on everything from now on. <laughs> <laughs> Have you noticed a change? And are you able... I can't imagine the club want you to, but are you, are you changing physique and what you're doing how, how quickly a, do you find that kind of that that how quickly do you shed weight or put weight muscle on etc right, I'm, I'm always fighting a losing battle with my weight like i if i don't lift for a week i'll probably drop about five kilo like easily if, if i just eat and then don't and don't really lift i could probably be from about i'm probably about 99 kilo now um and if i didn't lift for a good couple of weeks i'll be 90 kilos easy wow um, that's unbelievable Wait, how do you my... hold it yeah well I, I you know I didn't well I didn't used to and then now uh you know because obviously the, the, the do a lot of barbecuing and I'm and I'm training and I wasn't doing a lot of weights I was rehabbing my my pec and I started doing weights again and obviously I, I do conditioning along it with every day but I weighed in this morning 120 and that's like dehydrated <laughs> On the scale, <laughs> so I'm like that. Problem is, is that if you get to that stage, like that, by the end of the day, you know, I'd weigh, I'd weigh at about one twenty four. So, so I'm I'm getting bigger. Um, I'm still retaining a bit, of, like a bit of leanness, but um, yeah, that is the problem. I think as I've got older, I've just started retaining it because I understand like the calories in, calories out, and the tracking. It's it's um, it's hard, but it's the barbecuing. You know, it's like I. I you know, you end up having like, we get a pack of four burgers, right? And Chloe makes these unbelievable burgers. I'll come on a Saturday and she'll cook four sausages, four burgers. I'll eat three burgers and four sausages. And then, <laughs> and then, because I don't want to waste it, I don't want to eat food later. And um, before I know it, I've eaten that. And then you're like, oh, I've got into yogurts. What and Chloe says, I'm like, hey, um, we've been doing this series called Locked Up. I don't know if it's on, if you've anyone seen it on Instagram. Yeah, I saw a bit of it actually, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and Who did think- the cartoon on that, by the way? Uh, the Angry Bunny illustrations actually on Instagram. Yeah. He's fantastic. Smart, really, mate. He's really good. He does. Yeah. Um, but he, he's uh, done all the boys, hasn't he? Yeah. He's on most of the boys. Yeah. He's he's fantastic. He, so he, you know, he sort of messaged me and asked me about some stuff, and he's he's done me a few times. He's the one that superimposed me on all the the film actors things. Oh you know, like, yeah. yeah. Um, That's very good. And, and, and he did me as the Joker and everything else. I think he likes me because I just reposted them, even if they were like mocking me. <laughs> I was like, I quite like this. So we did the series, the locked up, and um, Chloe reckons I'm like. I am a 35 year old rugby uh, rugby player, but actually I'm a WI woman trapped in the body of a of a 35 year old rugby player. Where I I love a Muller fruit corner or like a Muller corner yogurt, and she's like, "You're like a WI woman. Like I love a little scone and jam and afternoon tea." So, I mean, you know, too many Muller too many Muller corners. But I will say this: they're not the fruit ones. They're like the ones with the chocolate chips and the and the chocolate flakes. It's sort of adult like. You know what I mean? And you wonder why you're 124 <laughs> kgs. Um, I'm in the 76 kg club and, and happy there as well. Um, coming up, we're going to talk about Lego, lavender oil, and the legend of chicken oh, fajitas. Are you comfortable with all of that? Any other L's course, that we should mate. put in there? No, mate, all good. No. Um, let's dive into the club, though. When, when did you join Exeter out of interest? And, and how did that, how did you joining Exeter oh, come about? <laughs> Um, when well, I now, 27. I joined them when I was 18, so yeah, nine years ago. Um, you yeah, were d- mate, where were you? You were down mental. at where were you originally? <laughs> Not Penzance oh, and Newlin, yeah, I was Penzance and Newlin. Oh, Penzance and Newlin. Um, yeah. I played for them from about six to 16. Uh, joined Truro College. Um, in my first year at Truro College, they said it would be quite a good idea for me to get some men's rugby. Exeter said this it'd be a good idea to get some men's rugby. I was 16. Um, and I was like, right, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I've played five months of college rugby. Now you want me to play men's rugby? <clears throat> so I was like, yeah, cool. And I joined Red. I went on loan to Red Roof. Um, if my mum and dad couldn't come to the games, they had to write me a note, uh, to give me <laughs> give me permission to play. Um, and I loved it, but hated it at the same time. I used to get beaten the living shit out of down there. Right. They had this little this little skinny sixteen year old kid running around at fullback. If I could be on the floor, because it was a national one at the time, so it was quite yeah. high. Like it was quite high for a sixteen-year-old. Um, but yeah, I was. I, I remember being. Bo- I realised you started at sixteen. That is unbelievable. Yeah, I was bottom of rucks, getting shooed, getting punched. That's why his knees know. and ankles and shoulders yeah. don't work anymore. <laughs> that's why I'm absolutely fucked now. But uh, but then uh, I played there till I was about seventeen. Uh, that's when I joined. Then I started playing a lot more A League games. I uh, played a couple of like LV games and stuff for Exeter, and then actually signed for them and moved up there when I was when I was eighteen. Did you see things in your Red Roof days that make fire pussy look like a picnic? I mean, I imagine as a 16-year-old boy, it puts eyes on your chest pretty quickly, that that kind of environment. 100%. I think 
my first, I remember my first training session down there was a guy called Nathan Pedley. Uh, and he was a bit of a, a red roof legend down there at the time. And he, it was a little touch, touch game, you know, a little warm up. He picked me up the spear tackle me on my head. <laughs> and I was just like, what the hell am I doing here at the moment? And then, uh, from that, I got back up, carried on playing. It's kind of, you know, the kind of the way I play now is just kind of got crack on with it and get on with it. Um, and from then they looked after me. They loved me down there. Um, kind of took me under their wing down there and he was a bit of a hard man at the time. So, um, yeah, kind of, I've used that as building up from it. And then when I got to Exeter, you know, I already had about a couple of years of men's rugby under my belt. Um, but even though when I turned up Dexter, there was Nemi Nadala in the change room sat up next to me. And I was just thinking, what the hell is this? This is another step up again. Um, but no, it was cool. It was cool. And then, yeah, nine years later, I'm kind of sat, sat here now. It's a bit, a bit mental. Unbelievable. And the thing that always strikes me about Exeter is is the sort of the team spirit of that place. And that you've got a really good bunch of guys, similar age, you've all come through together. I mean, is that is that what keeps you all in Exeter, that kind of, that of that bond, I suppose? Yeah, I think so. I think, <clears throat> I think to, to be honest, when, when we were growing up and we came into the club, there was boys like, you know, Jim Skaysbrook, uh, Hayden Thomas, Matt Jess, Garen Steenson, Phil Dolman, boys that are still there now. Um, but they were, they were hard men. And I remember, and I remember obviously Rob, Richie Baxter as well, them all being very, very hard men. And thinking if you ever want to get into this team, you're going to have to probably roll, roll your cuffs up a little bit and you need to get hard and get in there. Um, and I just remember just every single preseason, it'd be hard work. It'd be like when you think you're knackered, you just want to keep going. And that's that's the only thing it'd be. And it'd be like looking after your mates, looking after your friends, looking after each other on the field. Uh, as long as you're working hard, the coaches are going to be happy. Um, and that's kind of the way we thought we had to be growing up. And because there were so many of us at that stage coming through, and we're kind of still there now, uh, that's what was kind of embedded into us to, to, you know, to make us become the players we are now. Um, and that's what we try and drive still at the club. I think. Were you um were you a tough kid or did you have to learn it? Um <clears throat> I'd say my family's pretty tough, you know. There'd be times me, I was the oldest, so I was kind of looked after a little bit, but you know, I know there was times when I was younger, my two younger brothers, if they were fighting in the lounge or something or in the you know, around the kitchen, my old man would pick them both up, take them outside, put them into the garden and say, Right, you two can fight out here, come back in when you're done. Uh, and little things like that. So we are, we are, I've got a massive family. Um, we are, they're all like, they're all fishermen. They're all hard men. They're all, you know, grunting and groaning. Um, so I would say we've come from a pretty hard upbringing. Um, but it's one of those things, my old man and my mum always used to be like, if you want something, you'll kind of go get it yourself. Um, and that's kind of the way that, that that's worked for me, I think. I remember watching an interview with your old man, well, it must have been a few years ago. I think it might've been on the rugby club or something <laughs> like that. And it was, it was round right about the time you were breaking through um, and I'm like, I, I, I'm, I'm, I can't actually remember the exact detail of it, but he did he miss quite a lot of your early rugby because he was out on the boat doing the day job? Oh, yeah, I'd never seen my old man when I was younger. <laughs> my old man would be so their, their, their trips when he used to go out. Um, I call him a fake fisherman now because he, he owns a, he owns a few boats, uh, so he never goes out to sea anymore. So I don't call him a fisherman, but uh, he they, their trips would be eight days out. Uh, then they'd come in for, you know, maybe a day and a half and then they'd go back out for another eight days and they'd do that for a good couple of months solidly. Um, so I'm one of four. So my mum would literally be doing it all by herself. Um, so it's pretty, pretty, pretty mental, especially now I've got another kid on the way. I could never do it by myself. <laughs> Did you ever go out with him? Did you ever get sort of a, an initiation? <clears throat> no. Have you been joining him or not in that sort of trade? If I'm perfectly honest, going up through school and stuff, I hate absolutely hated school, and it was always one of those ones where I'd say, "Oh, that's fine. I'm probably just going to go fishing anyway." Because like, I think I'm the I'm the first no to have not carried on the the family tradition of fishing or not take on the business or anything. So, and then my brothers have kind of followed me as well. So there's no more there's no more male no's that are going to take right. on the fishing. So I am I've never actually been out. I've been out in the bay and stuff, but I've never been out for a, a full eight day trip. Oh, there's always post rugby, of course. When your ankle gives up, you might find yourself out on the trapeze on one of those trawlers. Well, well, 
everything that's going on at the moment. I took him the old man ring last week, said, right, I might need a job in a couple of weeks, Dad. What do you think? <laughs> well, also, if you, if you think getting away in the garage for five hours is a good idea, you'd get away for eight days on a boat. Imagine exactly. Right, you, you, your five hours in the garage is one. Your dad probably your dad probably went round the corner to a different, a different part of Cornwall or wherever it was, different part. I just yeah. put out of the freight weeks in a travel lodge. And he was like, oh, God, it's so bad at sea. Oh, bleh, oh love fish. He'd go down to the supermarket and pick up a load of fish. He's smart. I told you there was when, when old um, Ricky Flutie used to tell his missus that uh, that the England camp started on a Saturday instead of a Sunday night, and he'd, he'd go around and hide at uh, 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 Simon Shaw's house. But they stupidly went to Zoran's, that lovely cafe in St Margaret's. His missus Will passed the pram, looked in the window, <laughs> saw him, and they just sent him a text going, "If you are going to lie, don't go to our local cafe, you dickhead." <laughs> But there's a lot of lads, I think there's a lot of lads who were doing that over time, going, oh, get away from the kids. Gosh, camp, camp starts on a Friday night. Didn't start until seven o'clock on a Sunday. They were hiding <laughs> around and like sleeping in a bunk bed at a mate's house, just trying to get away. It's the away games, away. mate. Growing up, the boys used to love away games. So I was like, are you joking me? Like, I can't stand away games. You've got to be away from home. You can't... Mate, we get there now. Boys are in their bed at like six or seven o'clock. They're like, oh, you'll understand one day when you've got kids. Now I'm like, holy shit, you're right. <laughs> Going three days ahead of time. I've always, how the hell do you guys pass the time on those away trips? There is, I mean, do you fly to Newcastle or do you bus it? Uh, we, I don't know, mate, I've never played there. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, you know i'd Four never balls. i'd never played uh until sort of like 10 years into my was career i'd never played away at newcastle i'd yeah. like to get out of it every single time like we always said that if we could, i mean i love exeter but i said if i could get exeter relegated and we could get newcastle relegated we never have to leave anywhere we could have just sat in the middle of the country perfect couple of hours always home it's the old M25 hamstring, isn't it? Will Carling and Will Greenwood had two of the best M25 hamstrings in the game, I think. Never played in the way match outside of the, the ring. So, I mean, you, but you guys must have a heck of a routine to pass the six, seven hours. I mean, what's your nearest game? Bath? Uh, yeah, Bristol. Bath, Bristol. Bath Bristol. So what do you still, do when you've got to go to Newcastle? Still, like, well, obviously not Newcastle, but Northampton or Leicester. Or, I mean, that's, a, that's half a day on a bus. Uh, we always leave. So whether it is Bristol or Leicester or anything, we always leave on the Friday. Um, so even if it's an hour up the road when we play Bristol, we always leave Friday afternoon and spend the night in the hotel. We always keep it very, very like similar each time. Have you got um, a pimp bus with the you know the kitchen at the back and the beds and that kind of thing? Or are you all in a yeah. minibus and the uh, legs out the window? No, no. Tony Rowe likes to spend the money on his buses. He likes to show them off a bit. Um, our buses are Xboxes, Playstations, Wi-Fi, cookers, ovens mental mate so we don't actually mind being on the on the on the on the bus i love that house you used to have a horse and cart didn't you was it a... <laughs> Boy, xbox and playstations we all we ever used to get was a, a crap school bus and Lawrence Delalio's <laughs> only video he ever owned a copy of sexy beast that he'd come on the bus go fucking no lads got video for the boys he'd be like oh please don't be sexy beast please don't be sexy beast oh sexy beast because he thought he was ray winston he was just put that in there in a school like that Sitting next to <laughs> sitting next to Shawzy, <laughs> and he'd be looking, he'd be tutting at me I'm like Shawzy, you're eight foot tall, chief. Like you know, and walk, wake up and turn up with full rigor mortis. Some like the, the physios having to get to a spatula out of the seats. Hey, unbelievable! When we had, we, you know, actually, to be fair, it was they had those. Um, we had the coaches, but they never let us operate microwaves or ovens or anything. We, you know, giving a box of water in a protein bar. You're like, Oh, this is lovely. Uh, no, we never had any of that shit. <laughs> Fucking hell. You boys are unbelievable. No wonder you win everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We don't. We don't. Because the, the Saracens, because they're cheating bastards. But if you did, we, you know. <laughs> Do you want to get into that now? Do you want to go to Saris? Were you, were you quite outspoken about Saris, Jack? Or did you just lump it? <laughs> don't put your head down and hide. <laughs> or did you just... Um, I can't remember. Did you say anything? Quite a few of the extra boys oh, yeah. did. I know I, I didn't say anything personally. Who did? I, can't, I don't think many of the boys did. Tony Rowe had a lot to say, understandably Tony Rowe, as well. I know, I know our big boss man did. But, is it just, uh, is yeah. it, is, has that ship sailed or is there, is there more to well, be done I, about it? I think for me, like, it's just one of the, it, like you say, it is one of those things. It's been on for a few years, isn't it? But uh, I, I, to be fair to the Saris lads, I get on with them very, very well. Like, if I look at boys like Jamie George, you know, lads like that, I class them as some of my good friends. And, the thing I look at is <clears throat> it all came out after. That's the thing. It's not. It wasn't a big deal for me. Um, 
it was what was going on with them. You know, I can't really affect that. It's just for me, it's just another game of rugby. Um, and what goes on behind closed doors, really, I can't really make an make an impact about. To be honest, he's good. Page eighty four yeah. of the media handbook. Boys, but boys, can, boys. You know, boys. I think we 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 have used it as you know a lot of motivation, but you know, just as much as what we do when we lose to them. Um, yeah. You know what I mean? It's just one of those things where okay, we're not quite at our best where we where we can be because they've beaten us. It just means we've got to get better. Yeah. It has been a hell of a journey. And for someone who's been there sort of coming through the ranks and, and sort of growing with the club kind of thing, I mean, what, what is the ethos of the club now? How do you move <coughs> from the extraordinary journey you've been on coming up through trapdoor after trapdoor and now kind of sitting pretty at the top and maintaining that? What, how, do you, how do you set yourself up as a club coming into this I season? I think we, we've, we have, we've changed quite a bit as a team. You know, we've got a pretty good rep, well, good and hard reputation of, you know, playing hard and, you know, physically being there, but then also partying pretty hard as well. Um, but you just can't do that and perform very well each week with drinking that amount of alcohol. You know, we still have our socials and stuff like that. But when we do have socials, we do have big socials and that's got to be a big buy-in, to be honest. But yeah, like I said, you can't do it every week anymore. That is about the best answer I've heard in any chat we've had. <laughs> just the fact that the fun remains such an integral part of it. Hoff, I mean, you know, uh, are you are you sad that you didn't have? But actually, in Wasp days, I suppose you did. Yeah. But that there wasn't more of that. You know, one of my regrets I've said on here before was not celebrating those moments. So I probably wouldn't drink a lot of time. I wouldn't drink. I wouldn't go out, and I would avoid it. And I avoided a lot of teams, team stuff, not team socials, but like just random nights out. And that was. I think, I don't know if I talked about it on here, but actually when the Wasp boys invited, well, a few of the guys used to go to Vegas and I was about uh, 21 when they, you know, a few of the lads were going to Vegas. And I said to them, end of the season, I'd like to go to Vegas. And they actually had a bit of a committee. They were concerned that I was going to go all the way to Vegas and be, you know, a non-event. Uh, I think Jack's right. I think all those things are important. Like I know about the extra team socials. I know what a close bond they've got. But I think in, in professional sport, you have to, you have to change that. I mean, I still did train in Vegas because I think I went before a World Cup camp one year. I ended up there thir- thirteen times. Incredible place. And uh, I was one of my one of my mates was walking past the gym, and I, we'd obviously had a session. I was in the day doing like a treadmill sprint session, and he was like, "Check, see this big this big unit." Like, I think I have a shirt off, like sprinting this like Hard Rock Hotel treadmill, and he came in, came past, and a, a guy wearing a full like robe white guy wearing a full robe and moroccan slippers that curled up at the end <laughs> just walked walked over to the dumbbell rack dumbbell rack and was like picking up these twos and like doing this thing like i, I thought i was hallucinating i was like i was and i was like this going can anyone else see this guy like he's in his pajamas with the moroccan slippers doing weights like ah, ah. and i turned and my mate who was with me on the trip was just standing there and they went i came in to see you has but what is going on with that guy? <laughs> and then we, we, we end up, we end up, he spotted us and we end up befriending him as you do in Vegas. But no, I, I think it's important to have the, to have the team socials. But unfortunately, when the margins of success are so small, when every team is as fit now and as strong, you know, the team that recovers the best, that can implement the game plan, you know, the best will be successful. But that being said, one of the most important things are the bonding moments on those buses, on those away trips. And that's what brings a team closer together. And it's the people who isolate themselves from those things that more often than not don't ever be part of it. So it's, I think it's a fine balance, but it's very, very important, I think. Can I ask you about Rob Baxter, the coach? Because so, uh, I've said in the past, that the, from, from a sort of, um, I suppose, an analyst point of view, the two people who I've always said I see the game almost in a sort of different matrix were Dean Ryan and, and Rob Baxter. And when they were studio guests, they just explained what was happening out there in a way that I sort of set them apart as a coach. Is he, is he, I mean, did you find that with him as a coach? I mean, you've been coached by obviously England coaches and, and, but he's been your, your club coach. Does he break the game down for you in a way that sort of other people fi- find really easy to, to, to understand and to, and to get involved in? Yeah, I think, I think it's exactly like you said. Like it's the very same as when he comes in and describes something to you. It's the same with us. Like I could go into a meeting and not have a clue about what anyone's talking about, what we want to get out of this, or what uh, whatever. But then he'll come in and probably say four words, uh, and then it would be completely clear. Um, I could completely disagree with what he says or what he's thinking. Um, then he'll come in and explain it to you, uh, and then I leave the room thinking, actually, I completely agree with him. Um, he's just very good at, with his words. He's very good at knowing his players as well and knowing what he, like each individual player 
um, can bring and what he needs to make him better, I think is the big thing. And I think it was also a little bit easier for him. He's been at the club longer than, you know, any of us. Um, so he's kind of seen all of us come all the way through. So he knows us very, very well. Um, and I know the amount of work that they put on uh, with with people they sign, him and Ali, they look into them massively. And if they're not going to add to the team, they won't be at our club. And that's, that's the, the big thing that I, I find from him is just him knowing his individuals and his players and who he wants there. Are you someone who, who loves the game, gets the game, is big into the analysis, or are you someone who says, tell me what to do and I'll do it? Yeah, I can't stand analysis. I don't like looking at other players. Um, I, just, I, I, find, I find it really hard to get my head around some things of, you know, you need to watch individual players, but like if they did it last week, it doesn't mean they're going to do it this week. Do you know what I mean? So what's the point of me, me knowing that? Um, every team's going to be different. You know, we changed what we did last week to this week. So what's the point of learning what they do last week? Um, you know, some things are going to be similar. Uh, but for me, I just like to keep it very simple. It's a game of rugby. There's no point overthinking about it, overthinking it. You know, you just go out there and play what's in front of you um, and just have a f- bit of fun with it. You win or lose. Like, everyone wants to win. Um, but sometimes it doesn't quite happen. <laughs> It's a brilliant, it's a brilliant life <laughs> actually at this point in time. Um, guys, let's have a little pause. We're going to do our mid-show trail and remind everyone that you're watching and listening to House of Rugby on Joe together with Guinness with me, Alex Payne, alongside Hask and the Exeter England winger, fullback and soon-to-be flanker, Jack Knoll. Still oh, to come, we're going to talk Lego, pre-match routines and Eddie Jones' plan for Jack to play every position on the pitch. But first of all, don't forget to check out House of Rugby Shorts which is out every Friday during the lockdown. 20 minutes of no-frills rugby conversation with a different guest each week. Uh, and make sure also that you get stuck into the new podcast from Joe called Sports Pages, which digs into the stories behind some of the greatest sports books ever written. This week with the cycling journalist Jeremy Whittle on his 2008 book, Bad Blood, The Secret History of the Tour de France. Uh, here he is talking about his relationship with Lance Armstrong. I got just an email out the blue from Armstrong saying, did you work with Waters on this book? Which I said, yeah, I did. And then the next email fired back kind of three minutes later was, who's your legal counsel? Now that to me was kind of right back into like, you know, I'm going to sue your ass, Lance Lance Armstrong. And I thought, where where did that come from? Because libel and defamation law in Britain is the strictest in the world. You also know you confessed. You also know, you know, Da, 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 da. There's a whole list, list of things that you could reel off. Why would you send me an email like that unless you're just trying to bully me a bit, like you used to do 15 years ago? Have you changed? I thought you changed. I thought you were having therapy. I thought that stuff was finished with. So that was really disappointing on a personal level, more than a professional level. Have you spoken to him since then? No, and I don't really want to, actually. I don't right. really want to. I, I lost what kind of last bit of respect as a... He's a middle-aged man now, you know, I'm a middle-aged man. We've both got kids. It's like, why would you send that email? So any respect that I had for him, it's nothing to do with the doping. It's just like, why would he do that? You're watching the House of Rugby on Joe, together with Guinness. Uh, So that was Jeremy Whittle on this week's Sports Pages podcast, which is out now. Lance Armstrong, the gift that keeps on giving. Don't forget that you can join our House of Rugby Facebook group. More than 40,000 of you in there at the moment. Uh, and if that wasn't enough, you can also check out our Instagram, which is at Rugby Joe for photos, news, and behind the scenes bits and pieces. Did either of you ever buy into the Lance Armstrong phenomenon? I did. Did you? Yeah, I bought all of his books, read his books, and um, yeah, really got into. You know, really thought he was the absolute boy. You know, one of the things that always stuck with me was, um, you know, he said he, he did some horrific mountain climb, got to the bottom or got to the top, I should say, or went down back down the bottom, was like this wasn't good enough and went and did it again. And I always just thought that engine, but I was like, if you geared off your head, turns out that you can do it again and you're absolutely fine. Um, with your EPO, you've done so much EPO that, you know, your blood's like ragu. Um, it, you know, it's probably easy, quite easy to, to whip up and down a mountain. But yeah, I did I did buy into it. Were you gutted when the truth came out or had you moved on by then? No, nah, listen, Alex, you know me. I, 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 if you've learned anything from... I mean, obviously, he's an extreme version, but if you've learned anything from watching, you know, uh, uh, Michael Jordan documentaries, the stuff about Mayweather, all these people, they're all human and everybody makes mistakes. Tiger Woods, everybody fucks up in some with some degree and we as population want to believe because we want to put these people to a higher ideal and we ultimately put so much pressure on them. But he, you know, he obviously 
got away with it to such a degree i watched you know i watched that um is it icarus on on netflix yeah, that's you know, an amazing documentary amazing documentary I, I i read the book about lance armstrong and the systematic blood doping and stuff and it's just you know he it, it, it did it he gambled the ultimate gamble you know he gambled i'm gonna cheat that'll bring me fame it'll bring me fortune it'll bring me notoriety but you know he just it, it, it was always gonna get caught because nobody was gonna get away with it that long wax wings melted um, right, Jack, I want to talk a bit more about you. I want to talk about some of your sort of, um, I suppose, the highlights of your career. We actually had Hask last week saying that you'd love to have won another premiership title in the latter stages of your career. Um, you got close, but then someone went and spoiled it. <laughs> Shit, I forgot about um, that. Because <laughs> actually that was, that was the Lion... No, what was that? Was that, yeah, that, that was, was that the Lions tour. Yeah. God, it was sick. And you went... That's an extraordinary story. Winning it, bus journey down to Exeter... And then yeah. back, taxi back to London almost on a straight turnaround. But tell us about the game and what becoming Premiership champions sort of meant to that club after the journey that it, you'd been on. I think the, the big one, obviously, we lost the year before to Saris, didn't we? Yeah. Um, and I think that was the year where we kind of were just a bit like, yeah, this is cool. We're, you know, fresh out the championship. We were lucky to be here. Um, you know, it's quite nice to be playing at Twickenham. You know, a few of our boys were, you know, that was the biggest game they've ever played in. Most amount of people, they, they used to play in, you know, what's the top? Probably somewhere like Leicester Tigers, 30,000 or just under. <clears throat> and that's the most they've ever played in. So then to rock up at Twickenham, 80,000 people in one of the biggest games of their lives so far was a bit like, you know, a bit rabbits in the headlights there. You know, a few mistakes that we don't normally make. Um, and then even when we lost, we were like, yeah, this is, this is still quite cool. We got absolutely smashed. Uh, you know, awesome to be in a final. Um, but then it wasn't until the year after, I think, uh, I think it was Jeff Parlin, actually. I think that was the year we were almost halfway through and we were like 10th. Um, <clears throat> and we'd just been absolutely dicked by Claremont at home. And we're, I, I remember Jeff sitting in the meeting thinking, guys, we've just you know come from a premiership final where we've just lost. And now we're being dicked at home. We're 10th in the premiership. Like, what, what the hell is going on? we're not going to be given another opportunity like this. And that's where I kind of, we flipped our season around. And, you know, we, I think we won all of our games with most yeah. of them with bonus points after that. And then, you know, beat, had Saris in the, had Saris in the semifinals at home. And again, even then we, you know, we thought we were going to win that. And then we, you know, we found out we had Wasps in the final. And we kind of still went into that game thinking, no, this is, this has to be our year now. Um, was that semi-final just quickly? Was that the Henry Slade kick to the corner? Yeah, it's fluky kick that he's living on. I was going to say, was that was that middle of the that, bat, or did that come off the shin no. and somehow catch the wind into the right place? Have you seen how many guy, how many kicks that guy's missed the touch since then? <laughs> it's ridiculous, mate. It's like he's living off that moment, and that's what he thinks he can do every time, but he can't. He had the wind behind him, and he came off his left peg off the outside. He spooned it, and the wind took it into touch. I'm telling you, amazing. <laughs> you, mate, you need I a bit like every so often. Mate, I actually ho obviously Hoggy joined us this year. This year. And exactly the same position on the field, pretty much. Um, and Hoggy came up beside me, and then, Slate, and then Hoggy was like, oh, what move do you reckon we'll do off his lineup?" And I was like, hang on a minute, Hoggy, mate. <laughs> if I know one thing about Henry Slade is he doesn't always find touch. <laughs> and he's like, no, nah, no, nah, surely not, surely not. And I was like, no, here we go, watch. Kicked it, spooned it, off we went chasing. He comes running up next to me saying, fuck, how do you know that? <laughs> one or two of them occasionally end up on the M5 as well, don't they? Going south oh, exactly. on the... Uh, on the how is Boy Wonder? Is he is he looking? Is he st he's still growing the mo? Isn't he? I've unfollowed him off Instagram, so I don't know. <laughs> oh, really? Why? <laughs> Have you seen it, mate? No. It's it's like he wants to be a personal trainer or something. I'll have a look. Oh, really? Now. Have a little look. Have a little look. I, I I haven't seen it in probably about four weeks now, but I don't want to see running sessions that he does. I don't want to see you know what he's drinking or what he's doing. Um, it's just, oh, I just said, you know what, I don't need to see this. He's a good lad, but on social media, I'm like, no, I don't want to see it. <laughs> oh, yeah, just doing all the yoga stuff with his missus. And oh, and see what I mean? Yeah. I don't want I, yeah. Like, everyone does yoga. I don't need to show people how to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's, and he's, yeah, he's playing fetch with the dog. Oh, his dog, Frank, as well. We actually call, <laughs> we actually call him, we call him Reek of Game of Thrones. <laughs> Reek. <laughs> Oh, poor dog. Mate, he so, doesn't like it. He, it doesn't, he's beautiful. He, doesn't get he can car. do what he wants. He, he, he is, yeah, he is a beautiful man and very talented. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, but I'm not going to lie. When he, when he kicked that kick and he found the five-meter line, I was, you know, we were loving him then. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. And the Premiership final, what did you learn from the year before that worked the year after? 
Went we to the post the extra time, pull a scrum down, get a penalty yeah. and win. <laughs> Make sure that Nathan Hughes puts his hand into a rut with the referee. Everyone's going, take your hands <laughs> out. Stop, we're going to win the game. Oh, and we've gone to extra time. I don't know what happened. I, yeah, yeah, I don't know what he was playing at. I reckon there was about five of you lads behind him shouting at him as well. And he's still looking at the ref saying, I've got the ball. It's like, oh no. <laughs> no, no, the referee don't care. And then it just went, uh, but the best bit was that after that first scrum, Jack did boom, inside ball, just scored under the post. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> honestly, you know, just we got the lads and I was like, everyone's just like this. <laughs> uh, it was your, I was like, lads, it, it, he's going to do that again. Like, he can't. It was like the worst start to a final. We're like, we're ready. We're going to win. Oh, God. 30 seconds in. Jack Knowles <laughs> steps someone. Boom. Inside ball off 10. Fallen over and scored. Little blue scrum cap that I used to wear. But he started wearing it. <laughs> and I, I had to stop. I had to go to the red one. Why did fringe- you stop? Because they got confused. Kept it, mate. <laughs> Do you remember the best bit was that we're doing you down and doing me down and doing this down yeah. together? Uh, like yeah. if they'd be like, "Oh, Jace Hassel's improved his footwork." I was like, "We don't even look the same." But look at the bit, and then and then <laughs> I did something, and I was like, "Well, J- J- you know, Jack Knowles slow to get out there." And it was me. Yeah, and I, I, and I knew it was bad. Jack, for some reason, obviously out of the backs is a lot harder. Jack missed the tackle, and they're like, "Oh, Jace Hassel's missed the tackle." I was like, "This is bollocks." And all I've got is my tackling. That's a lie. I had an all round <laughs> skill set, but you know, for the purposes of the joke. Um, yeah. Let's talk England for a little bit. Um, have you heard from Eddie in lockdown? Has he pinged you a little message saying, work on your <laughs> breakdown, and I want to see, you know, um, I want to see you lifting at the tail of the line out and that kind of thing? Where did right, that Has- come from? Right, Haskell would have got this as well. I get random text messages I think I, from him. I think I had one probably a couple of nights ago, three in the morning. Uh, how's, how's the surf? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, Eddie, we're in lockdown, mate. I'm not allowed to go in the water. <laughs> Um, but also, what are you doing up at three o'clock in the morning? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but does he, but no, is he, you know, he, we talk a lot about whether he uses carrot or stick with a player. Do you, which one do you get with him? I don't really know. Like, I'm, I'm know. the same with kind of every coach. You know, I don't really spend a lot of time with the coaches. I don't really spend a lot of time talking. You know, if if they want to talk to me, they'll you know ask me to come speak to them, and we'll say what needs to be said, and then I'll go off and do my own thing, um, or I'll do what I'm told, and that's that's simply it. But I always try and avoid them. Um, nice. and I think Eddie Eddie's a bit like that as well he's just happy with me doing my own thing um, as long as I'm doing it right and I'm doing it well I think he's quite happy for me just to, to plod along and uh, and do that um, but yeah that, that back row flanker situation was a bit of a weird one for me did he tell you uh, he was going to do it did he say right this is the story this week or did he just do yeah. it and then come by and, <laughs> come back and say by the way you're um, yeah you're covering no, the open side did he? How I? <laughs> you know what it's like in 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 Camp Pask. Uh, I I think he did media on like a Tuesday night or whatever it is. And then by this time we're all in our beds. You know we don't really go on our phones, so we're sleeping, watching a film, whatever. And I've woken up in the morning on or it's like the Wednesday or whatever it was, and my phone has gone absolutely berserk. And I'm like, family are trying to text me, and you know my Twitter, Instagram, and I'm scrolling through thinking, what the fuck is going on here? Like, what has happened? And then I go on it, and the first one says, is Jack Noel is, is in the lineup for a flanker this weekend against <laughs> Wales, or whatever it was. And I was thinking, what the hell? And then my mum's texting me saying, are you moved position? Are you now in the forwards or something? What's going on? And I literally had to go up to Eddie, and I was like, is this, is this happening? Are you wanting me to go in the back row and stuff like this? He's like, he just looked at me, laughed, smiled, gave his old, his old grin and was like, ah, don't worry about it, mate. <laughs> Off you go. I was like, all right, okay. Yeah. I was a little bit gutted to be honest because I thought, you never know, it could be a chance here. But uh, no, he was literally just thinking about having, uh, having a bit of a laugh. And it's kind of like, he, he actually did say to me that, that game, I think it was the Wales game. He was, he said to me, like, you're on the wing, but I don't want you anywhere near the wing. I want you around our forwards. I want you to help out our forwards. I want you to pick and go. I want you to, you know, do all this sort of stuff. And I think Tom Curry got uh, carded that game. So I actually went on the flank anyway, <laughs> which is pretty cool. <laughs> I don't know why he would have picked you at flanker when, when he's got Johnny May as a ready-made replacement. We have oh, little conversations. And obviously... If a flanker goes off, it gets yellow carded, then the winger is probably the first person to come in or the centre. Uh, normally, we use the wingers. So, uh, all of us, uh, Neil Hatley at the time was like, right, can we have a little meeting after the forwards done scrummaging? Wingers, I want you to come over. We'll talk through this. Everyone comes. 
Johnny comes to walk up and Neil turns around and goes, except from you, Johnny, you can go do some <laughs> kicking, whatever. <laughs> How the hell he ended up on the side of a scrum in an international match is one of the great <laughs> Was it you in the bin at the time, Hask? Mate, it wasn't me. It, I was at home watching like everybody else, just like this dumbstruck going, you can't fault his enthusiasm. But it, right. it, but also the thing is that we joke about this and I've always said, maintain, I don't care about scrums. Um, you know, they're, they're very dull and annoying. But like, you know, scrum coaches and actual aficionados, that would have made them livid. That would have made their blood boil. Like if you don't get a, you know, as a prop, if you don't push properly as a flanker, especially if you're a winger and you're supposed to be there, they get irate. They just go mad. And, you know, they'll blame it on you, blame it on you lads, if they get pushed over the line. They're like, ah, oh, I need a flanker. It's like, lads, come on. Your one job's push. But have you, ball, <laughs> have you, have you balls that up? But I love just Jack with the, um, the the thing with the player, the flanker stuff. You know, we say, uh, you know, Eddie, you know, control the narrative, control the, where the pressure's put. I just, I, I love it. I told you just make stuff up. Literally just make <laughs> stuff up. Like, they could, they call me and just go, right, you, you, you're not allowed to say this. Like, what do you mean? You're not allowed to talk about the opposition at all in the media. And they go, right, go. And then I see the media guy, be like, marking it down. And then he'd be like, <laughs> mate, how'd you do? And I was like, I didn't mention what's good, mate. And just give me like a protein <laughs> shake. Get that in you. All right, amazing. <laughs> It is brilliant. Unbelievable. We had um, Ben Youngs on last week talking about the sweet, sweet gate and being thrown Haribo and told that he had life choices in front of him. W- w- what was your first meeting with Eddie like? Was he um, was he good with you or did he challenge you? Do you have the rat's uh, tail when um, when Eddie first came along? Or you got rid of the, the exhaust pipe by that point? I think it was gone. No, no, I think I did have it. I think I did no. have it. I, I, I can't actually remember what my first meeting was like with Eddie was... He pretty much said that I need to work on a few things. And I was like, yep, yeah, cool, let's hear them. And he was like, oh, I need you to work on your footwork. And I was a bit like, oh, shit. <laughs> I think my, I was, me going for my career, kind of I was relying on my footwork and thinking that was the kind of thing that gets me a bit out of trouble. And uh, that's what I kind of backed myself on. And I was like, oh, you sure already? Like, like I was a bit, I was real confused from it. I was like, I'll probably class that as one of my, you know, one of my strengths when I'm playing. And he just looks at me and goes, Good, mate, good. <laughs> and off I went. And I was like, oh, wow, awesome. Cheers, Eddie. <laughs> he's, he is the master, master button pusher, isn't he? He we is. Had get, he is. Any other thing. He is. But it's interesting because, you know, Jack and I, uh, 2015 uh, World Cup, spent a lot of time together. Um, and like, we've always got on, you know, we've always got on well, Jack. I, it's bizarrely, even though you never would have noticed it, I, I did used to do a lot of footwork stuff with Jack uh, and everything else. Because, you know, it's not hard. We got it's, it's quite hard. We've got a turning circle up for 220 bucks, I used to but, love doing footwork with us. It was yeah, brilliant. <laughs> yeah, great confidence boost for me. A couple of times I did all right. A couple of times I tripped, tripped up and he fell over and I ran around. Um, but it's interesting, just a different dynamic as well. Because when Jack, you know, we were a full, bin juice in 2015 you know there used to be there was a bit more of a segregation in terms of Scott there was myself um uh Jack uh Slady uh Alex Good uh who else was the other one Danny Care Danny yeah um, and we used to just play, like always, you know, I became, during the 2015 World Cup, I went in there, 120 kgs, 8% body fat. I came out of it, 117 kgs, 12% body fat, and unbelievable at football. We were class, <laughs> mate. I was class. Like, I can't play football for toffee. Like, I'm terrible. Like, everybody knows, everybody I know has had trials. Mate, I whacked in like a, like a 40 meter volley on the volley. Like, lads were like that, going mad. Honestly, I became so good at football and football and football fitness. But I remember, I remember saying to, um, the then coach at the time, because I, I remember talking to Jack, like Jack was young, you know, Slade was young. I was slightly older in the tooth and we were doing this practicing, but you could see the boys were kind of a bit despondent. You know, when they were going to get the opportunity, you know, waiting for kind of Uruguay at the end, what was going to happen? And I remember saying, you know, um, look, I think you should go and have a world with, Jack doesn't know this, but I said, I think you should go and have a world with, with like Jack and Slade, just check in with them, see how they're doing, you know, just put an arm around, just get, you know, tell them what you're going to do. And you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember coming up, to, to Jack and uh, something like that. Did, did so-and-so speak to you? He was like, no. But there was the same situation, not with him, but with, with Eddie. You go to Eddie and go, listen, I think the boys just need a little bit of an arm round, a little bit of a pep up because, you know, we've not been involved. You know, it's a first, it was your first World Cup, Jack, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Yeah, first yeah. World Cup. It's a big moment. He hasn't played. You haven't, you know, hasn't had a lot of game times. So we're doing a lot of fitness. We're not really there on game days. You know, when we went to watch the games at the stadium, mate, we were like taken in the back door, right? You... We didn't have any food, anything. We were sort of on our feet for like six hours. I remember going to like the president's suite at the... Because I said to the lads, listen, follow me. Follow me. I'll get us a cup of tea and a biscuit. Because we were there for, for ages. Take them all through. 
right? When I said, let's we'll go up to the suite, knock the door, like presents, they were like, no, you can't come in. I went, well, we're England players, so we just want to get a cup of tea. No, no, you can't come in. I said, well, well I, I, how do you qualify to get into this room? Then what's the, well, we're at the stadium, so we're the only ones qualified to actually come into this room. Can't do it. So by the end of it, it was the groundsman used to let me, Jack, Slady, the boys have a biscuit and a cup of tea to sit there in the stadium. Then we'd sit in our seats and we wouldn't have anything to do with the team. Then we were bundled out the back door, whipped back to Penny Hill Park, you know, turn up for training, train the house down, boom, day before the game, right, football, extra conditioning. And it didn't really, we didn't really sit in the dynamic until the kind of Uruguay game. Um, and and but if you said the same conversation with Eddie, Eddie would have gone up and gone, good, mate, I'll have a word, I'll speak to him. Okay, noted. And I, that was just, what the, the, I think, the big difference between people is just understanding that you know, even though we were bin juice, you know, it's Jack's world, first World Cup, it's Slady's first World Cup. You know, these boys are integral because when they're ready to go, they need to feel like they're part of it. And I just think yeah. sometimes that's dropped the ball. Well, Eddie just doesn't ever let that happen. You know, if you, you know, if you're involved, he's always checking in. He's always the periphery. He might make up that you're going to be, you know, be playing hooker and you're, you know, you're a crash ball centre, but it, it's all part of the process. I mean, especially um, from, oh, sorry, from this, this, this year as well. You know, obviously I was injured for the whole thing. Like, the difference in what, you know, there was some times where we wanted to play football and we wanted to have a bit of fun, but at the same time, Eddie was like, no, you boys are going to be needed. Uh, you're still involved in this team. Um, and I, that's the whole thing about it is that everyone, that's why I think we did so well this year is that if we were just one team, you know, in terms of the stadium, you know, we're in a completely different country, but us as players would come in with the team if we weren't involved. Uh, we would then go to our seats. We'd be straight back in the change room with the boys after. Um, we'd be involved like that uh, and then training we'd all be doing exactly the same no one would know the team um, so we're all very very equal until the day before the game where the team would be announced um, and we'd do absolutely everything together which I think was the big difference because it is it is a whole squad effort and there's a lot for the boys that are starting it's a lot on their shoulders to, to be playing those games uh, but it is a lot for those boys that aren't involved in, in some of the games to pick the boys up as well and do it um, you've also got time what are you 27 Got time on your side. Twenty-seven. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Welcome to the um, <laughs> to the, the aging game. Um, so you, you've obviously done a couple of World Cups. I want to ask you about lines in a moment or two. But how many caps are you on at the moment? I can't remember what, what, your, what number you're on. Thirty, oh, forty, forty something. You must no, be really quite close 40. to the century. I'm, 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 I think I'm there. There, just over thirty-five, maybe. A lot of injuries. So you're closing in on the half century. But you, you know, what, what? How do you judge your England career so far, and and what do you want to get out of the remainder bit of it? Well, I, I, if I, if I'm honest, I can't remember an England game where I've played what I know I can do, I can perform how I can perform. If you know what I mean, I feel really? like I've never. Yeah, if, if I look at some of the way, I know it's a big step up between you know club um, and country. Um, but if I look at some of my performance that I've done for Exeter and I know what I can do on the field, I feel like I've not produced any of that yet in an England shirt. If I'm honest. That's amazing. Yeah. So, and why is that? If I'm honest, I don't know. I think the way the way Exeter our phase play and our and our you know the way we play Exeter is is different to the way we play England. Uh, the way we play Exeter suits me very very well, and I think a lot of that is down to to, to what the coach has put in place for you know people like me in my position that can show what they're about. Uh, England um, it is a bit different you know international rugby is at the end of the day is just about winning it's about making the right decision you know extra we rarely kick the, uh, you know kick the posts you know we will kick to the corner we'll go for the drive we'll get the ball out to the back as much as we can um, whereas England it is very different it's about winning you know, if there's three points in offer we'll take those three points um, but I just feel like for me I've not really uh, had my hands on the ball as much as I can uh, that I know I can I do for extra <laughs> that I haven't done for England yet Um I'm hoping now that this run of injuries is out of the way, I'll come back from this uh, you know, in the best shape that I have been in a while. And hopefully I'll get a chance to, to to perform like that. And like I said, I want to get to 50 caps for, for my country. I think that's a pretty pretty good achievement, to be honest. Yeah, not many do that. Um, in terms of sort of hunger levels, I imagine as a kid, I mean, playing at 16 in Red Ruth, you know, so much of it came so quickly to you. As you get older now and you've been through this injury nightmare, etc., do the hunger levels grow? Do you find yourself more concentrated on, you know, what you can do and the opportunities you've got perhaps than, than when you might have taken a little bit more for granted? The big thing that I love doing, and every every player says it, but it's just winning. And I think it's not winning for myself, but <clears throat> I love that feeling of winning when you've got 14 other blokes um, beside you that you've done it with. Um, you can't you can't re- recreate that feeling. I think it's absolutely phenomenal 
doing that, especially when you've worked hard and you've trained and you've played hard and you've got what you deserve from the game and picking something like that. Whether it's, you know, training, I, I love winning each game. We train our training games, every single match we play. Um, and I think it's doing it for the boys that I do play with. You know, I always say it, but the reason I have played for England, the reason I've gone on a Lions tour um, isn't because of what I can do. It's because of the positions that the team have put me in to, to achieve what I've done. Um, and I still say it, the highlight of my career is probably, sorry, Hask, but it's probably winning that, that premiership final. I think for me that, you know, beats my England caps, beats the Lions tour, just because I know how hard like everyone has worked in, in that team to get where we are and to win a premiership with them is, 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 is pretty special. That is a very cool thing to be able to say because I don't think there are many people out there who'd have done two World Cups and a Lions tour and put, put club at the top of it. Um, I remember watching the video of you being, um, I think uh, it was on Sky Sports News, I think, the day you were announced in the Lions squad. I think you're, the, am I right in saying you're the first chief to go on a Lions tour? Yeah, yeah, I have from, yeah, from coming up. We had Jeff Parlin at the time, but he was signed here. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, he'd signed in. So, I, and I remember just the mobbing that you got. But do you, do you talk talk to me about 2017? And again, that that experience. We've heard so much from Hask, but I've seen one or two bits of um, of footage that made it look like a lot of fun. But did, you know, was <laughs> was it everything you wanted it to be? Mate, it was like 100. percent I had no idea what. It was very different to a to an England tour. Um, it was very much uh, you're all very good players. We're not going to put a lot of structure in place go out and play uh, and, and obviously try and win. And I think it was like a good old traditional rugby tour. <laughs> are you a superstitious? I want to ask a couple of bits. So we've got Lego and Lavender Oil I want to tick off. The Lego, are you actually endorsed by Lego now? You've done more for their sales, I think, than any other no, I'm public not, persona. I've not. I've had, a, I've had a few conversations with them, but I've never actually followed followed stuff up. You know, I, I what's like... You, what I, are you building I, at the moment? I've just built... I built a Land Rover Defender... Um, oh, nice. I did that. That took me a few days. Oh, I've done that. That's what I just finished. Oh, nice. You're properly into the Lego. Yeah. Again, that's another couple of hours home avoiding, mate. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a Lego shed as well as a gym. Um, I come in, I've got my own little room in the house. So I come in and I can't share it with Nori because she is, you know what they're like with kids. Our mind's got to be perfect. I separate all the Lego out. I make sure it's ready. I know what order I'm going to do it in. Um, and if she came in, she just messed it all up. So she's not allowed to do that with me. How old is Nori? Two, just under nearly two now. Just under two. Does she? Does she ever get her hands on it and remove key pieces? I'd love yeah. to know the reaction. Yeah, if, I caught her in the day kicking the kicking the Land Rover car around the, the room. I was fuming. Back door came off and everything. <laughs> <laughs> Christ, I didn't, speak to, I didn't speak to her for a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> quite right, quite right too. Put her in her place. Are there any other Lego aficionados in the game, or you, do you do you fly the kite solo? No, uh, I think. Tom Francis, big big Donny Tommy, uh, the club likes it. I know George North likes it. I spoke to him a bit on on tour about it. Um, but for me, it's one of those ones where I like doing it. I don't really want to like post a lot about Instagram. You know, like when you always say thank you for things and like that. So I'm quite happy just buying it and then doing it in my own time. And I don't feel like I have to have to say thank you all the time. Do you know what I mean? I exactly it's something that I've always done as a kid. So I will carry on doing it now. What is the best thing you've built? It was your pride and joy. My boy's done the Bugatti Veyron and the Porsche 911. I, I want to do the Millennium Falcon. Like, I quite like Lego, but the reason, the, I don't, the reason I don't go and buy it is because, uh, you know, once I built it, I'm like, do I really want to have Lego bits around my house? Because, you know, no, you, you know Chloe will walk in, I'll be like, meow, <laughs> pretend that I'm doing this. She'll be like, what are you doing? I'm like, nothing. <laughs> So I just, I just, I think it's once back, you make back into the cyber strip club with you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The process. Back on growth <laughs> What are you doing, James? It's part of the game, babe. It's part of the game. <laughs> uh, best thing, I put, I probably my the Land Rover, like the new Land Rover. I think it's pretty cool. You know the new Land Rover Defender that came out. That's yeah. just come out. They actually released the Lego um, model of it first before the car. So you, you got to see the Land Rover Defender in Lego before you saw the actual car. So I built that recently, and that, that was pretty cool. Um, lavender oil. Where does that fit into the prep? Big. Um, I, I, I absolutely love it. Uh, before I sleep, before I uh, in the morning when I'm playing, I've got a very very strict. I'm not superstitious or anything, but I have a very very strict pre-game. This has taken me years to master, but I've, I've done it. Um, so I sleep in my bed the night before a game when I'm at home. Yeah. My missus sleeps in the spare room. If if the baby wakes up, 
obviously she's got to deal with with Nori, um, especially when she was a baby. It's tough. Uh, I have my own pillow. My, my own pillow goes everywhere with me, away games, home games. I've always got my diffuser, my neon diffuser uh, with lavender, always pumping out of it. So it literally knocks me out. Uh, chicken feet is always not for a game. Um, but that's the big thing I have worked on is right Friday night, night before the game. That's my time. I need at least nine hours sleep. Um, I'm not a father for that night, that one night only. Um, I get to do that. And then we've got a good little base level now where it's really good routine for both of us. <laughs> I bet. Really good routine. I'm sure that Zoe's absolutely delighted with the routine that you've managed to lay down. That's unbelievable. I, I, I hope that you are accruing credits that you'll be paying back in, in years to come. Does Zoe sort of keep a logbook of... Um, of, of the deficit or it just is what it is sweetheart no 100 percent. she never during the week if nori wakes up she's like oh no your night's on friday so you're gonna have to get up tonight but All i right. if i don't get eight nine hours sleep at night i'm struggling the next morning probably a bit mentally as well it plays with me but i need a good night's sleep so i i do a bit like the gym where i say like i could be at the club now but i'm here i use that as a bit of a if i don't get a good amount of sleep i'll probably get injured um yeah and then it will be your fault <laughs> Amazing, because I'm, I'm fascinated. Because your your missus isn't that into rugby, is she? I've got this lovely quote clueless, from side dug out. We were friends, but never really got together properly until I was about twenty. I went back down to Cornwall to see my family and happened to bump into her. We had a really good catch up, and now we have a kid in a house, which sounds like a hell of a catch up if you're asking me. Um, does it help that your missus has got no interest in in sport? You love? Are you someone that needs to get away from the game when you when you have downtime? Yeah, hundred percent. I I have absolutely nothing in my house to do with rugby at all like i have no shirts on the wall uh no like no anything like you would walk you walk into my house and wouldn't think i'm a rugby player to be honest because i just feel like that's important to you know my rugby life is is out there that's what i do and when i come home i can't be bringing that with me because when i won't rest i won't you know when i lived in the academy house with the, with the lads you know we'd come home from training we'd talk about rugby We'd play rugby on the on the PlayStation. We would talk about what we're going to do at training tomorrow, and I was just absolutely knackered. Um, so to have a missus, like yeah, I, I've known her since we were sixteen. She originally moved down from Essex, lived a couple of miles up the road for me. Uh, yeah, bumped into her when I went down there randomly one night, um, and then yeah, kind of it was just kind of felt right at the time. Um, and like I said, she doesn't have a clue about rugby. Doesn't know what position I play. Uh, she only knows one position and that's the scrum math because they're the small guys uh, that's what she says so when I come home our conversation leads to house training yep good and that, that's pretty much as far as we go um, to be honest which I think is is, is class because I couldn't have a, a partner where I come home and just constantly talking about rugby to be honest uh, and I know there's a few boys that have them <laughs> Do you know players who yeah. get critiqued? Oh, <laughs> like, and, uh, <laughs> oh my god! Man. Like, so I think I think first it's interesting because you know what Chloe always took offence to was she, you know, the, the routine thing pre matches is, is what I work very hard on with like sports psychologists and different things. You know, I I, I got the old you know bad neck, so I take the the, the pillow with me. But the, the sleeping separate rooms, we I did talk, we did talk about doing things like that. But we, I never, I never did that. So I can understand the routine. And I always said we talked about it when Chloe came on that I said to my 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 then partners or and Chloe was um, you know, the day before night of a game. Said so, unless you're dying, I don't want to know. Like unless something <laughs> catastrophic happens, I don't want any drama. Don't want anything. I'm not. I'm not interested. And, and Chloe was brilliant. Where she got really upset was she thought that when I retired, the tables would turn and I was going to be super attentive. <laughs> We're going to have weekends. I just booked myself up all around the world. You know what I mean? I was like, where are you going? I'm just DJing in uh, the Belgium Grand Prix. See you, love. Um, but I just, <laughs> I just took her with me everywhere. So but that was quite interesting. But I do know, I'm doing players, that's partners, live and breathe. Live and breathe their, uh, their careers. And I find it astounding because they get dissected when they, when they come home. They're like critiqued. They get the hump when they don't do well. And also, if their players don't get, say, for example, picked for England, they're bawling in tears. So it's hard enough as a player, you know, especially men, you know, with male ego, you know, inability necessarily to always talk about your feelings. They, they have that. And then your missus is, 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 is crying because you didn't get in. I, I was just like that. Now, Chloe, Chloe became, uh, had a good understanding of the game out of necessity because I would value her opinion over certain things. But she, she, I've never, I've always gravitated towards people who I know nothing about the game, don't want to talk about it. If, you know, if I met somebody at a rugby game or they go, 
are you James Hassel rugby player? I'm like, see ya, because you just don't yeah. want that. You just don't need that. Any rugby nauses fans, I run off. It says rugby in their profile back in the day or anything. I just, pff, you wouldn't see me for love nor money because the last thing you want to go, oh, do, do, what do you think of, you know, so-and-so with a breakdown? <laughs> Fucking chill out, love. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> How do those players handle that scenario? I don't know if they Does love it as well. like it? Oh, it's carnage. Let's move swiftly on. I feel we're going down an alley where someone needs to find the verse and go back down something, <laughs> down something a bit newer. Um, I just want to pick up a couple of other quick bits. 5,000 calories a day. Is that what you get through? What was that? Do you eat 5,000 calories a day? I try to, yeah. What that? I mean, what, what else do you do other than eat? What, it, what, what goes in Mate, on a daily day, basis? Re- my day re- revolves around eating, to be fair. I, like, like I have to say, I'm one of the lucky ones where I can eat kind of what I want to a certain extent and probably still stay the same weight. Do you cook or is that... I, cook, I, 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 I love cooking, I do. So I what's the speciality? How the, I mean, how the hell do you find the enthusiasm um, to get through 5,000 calories? I, I just enjoy enjoy making different things, making different things up. Uh, so like what I like has said, I'm enjoying my barbecue at the moment. I'm absolutely probably smashing, you know, two or three barbecues. I think I did three barbecues yesterday, breakfast, lunch and dinner. Wow. Okay. That's, yeah, that's proper alpha male. Yeah. Um, ha- Hask, how many calories are you up to or down to nowadays? Uh, I'm, I'm down, actually. So I started retracking and I went down to about 3,500, 4,000, which I, I started dropping. I, I was up when I was training, it was about 5,500, uh, and I just couldn't keep the weight on. But I've kind of put all the weight back on and all the stuff that I lost in the jungle because I had such a shock to the system. You know, I starved myself, came out, started the fighting, was, was, was getting so you know, so lean from the fighting, I just couldn't put it. So with the lockdown, it's meant that my body's recovered. I started eating normally because during that training, I was waking up feeling so tired and sore. I didn't even want to eat, which is just fills into the whole cycle. So I was, like, I was so struggling because it just becomes fuel, really. Mad. Um, and why do you get to the ground three hours before kickoff on match day? What um, do you do? Physio, strap in. I just, like, I, like, I just like being there. You know, that's one thing I do struggle with away games is... Obviously, it's not your stadium, so you're there with the whole team, you're there at the same time. You know, when we played Glasgow away in this Heineken Cup uh, a few months back, we got there, I think, an hour before kickoff, which was my idea of an absolute nightmare. Really? We got there, stre- yeah, and it's freezing up there as well, so I had no interest whatsoever. Um, but I just like, I like getting there, I like getting early, I like setting my, my place out nice and neat, that I've got everything there ready for what I need. Uh, my strapping's all done, my physio's done, I have a good warm-up. Uh, my tendons aren't the best, so I need to spend a good bit of time warming them up. Um, and I just don't I just don't like rushing around. I like being pretty chill, to be honest. If it works, you gotta you gotta do it. Um we were just nattering sort of before before we started recording recording about whether we're gonna get any rugby. What are you hearing? Are, are we likely to see everyone back in their boots sooner rather than later, or is it control or delete and let's come back in a new season? So I think <sighs> Again, we, we don't know 100%. You know, we're still hearing rumours as well, but like everyone else reading what's online. Um, we want to play. I think uh, we feel like the season's not finished for us, so we we still want to win stuff. But we're here and we've obviously got to follow what the government's saying and, and things like that. So in terms of we could be in training. Uh, but I've heard there'll be steps of, you know, they can have five boys in there at a time, run on the, run on the field, carry on doing your own weights at home. Uh, and then they just build up slowly. So hopefully there will be some some rugby. Um, do, do you actually mean that, or would you months? just rather have the trophy like they're going to do to Liverpool and then uh, <laughs> you know get the medal, job done, come back in a new season? For me, that would always be. Oh, you won it that year that you just given it. Do you know what I mean? You you, you probably won't deserve it. Um, even though we are top at the moment, I feel like we won't deserve it. So if we did get given it, I wouldn't class it as having it. I'd I'd rather play the games out. To be honest. All right, good answer. Um, and then obviously we mentioned Bambino on the way in five weeks' time. I mean, is it just... Have you, I presume you've got everything ready. You know, you, you don't need to buy a double buggy or... No? Or have that, you got, you've got work to do on that front? We've got a lot of work. We haven't done anything. But, like, it's the same what everyone says. Like, everyone said so much to me before, and it just is so true. First kid, you, you know, you have 20,000 nappies prepared and folded up perfectly in the wardrobe and clothes. 
Uh, you have the bed made, you have the cot ready, you have baby comms and everything, which we were. This second child hasn't even got clothes yet. I mean, it's five weeks down the line. It's going to be running around naked for the first couple of months, I think. Um, but it is your second kid. You don't have anything prepared for it. So, we're, you know, if it's a girl, it can have all the nori stuff. Um, and then we'll, we'll deal with it when it's here. <laughs> yeah. If it's a boy, probably still have nori stuff for the, uh, yeah. for the short term. I like it. Um, <laughs> Jack, you're a superstar. I've really, really enjoyed nattering, actually. And it's been lovely to kind of, yeah, just chat, not not interview, I think. Um, any other business this week, fellas? Hask, anything that we need to know? Any other bits and bobs? No, I just, um, I feel like we haven't even touched the surface with Jack, you know, as I, I said. I know, I get the sense there are two or three other shows still to come out of this. <laughs> That's the thing, because he's, he's very relaxed, like, down to earth, and has always been like that, and, like, been a good character, and is a genuinely good lad. Like, you know, and I think that, that follows on with the, the rest of the Exeter team, you know, we talk about that that kind of stuff that I'm sure we'll have to get you back Jack for some more um for some more stuff and also I always get the feeling that Jack if you wind him up enough he'll just tell you everything it'll just be <laughs> everything so you have to like you have to go back and like rebuild calm yourself down and then we'll get, get him again another time um I'd love to talk to Karen Dick you know, and, and and do we do Henry Slade as well it's like watching bloody paint dry if you want Henry Slade I'm telling you fuck you know. <laughs> I, I, knew, I knew the it. poor guy I mean he just he, he's just he's too handsome though. who else do we need to do on the Exeter crew um who's a good crack Baxter I'd um, love to do Baxter actually Baxter would be good Jack have you have you ever were you um, a little dragon no no that was uh, Slady that was Slady and, yeah. and Mike Fritt Brown yeah uh, poor, what's poor a little dragon is. Peter Short. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, oh, you tell it, you tell it, because you know it. Yeah. Obviously, Peter Short was a, uh, you know, big old, big, big bastard. Came from Bath. and uh, Who did he have at Bath? Did he have a Bendenham and he had someone else? I'm not sure who the little dragons were in that. Yeah, team, he had two. He had two. Basically, he comes into the club and he looks at two of the academy lads and he's like, right, you're my dragons. And calls them the little dragons. And then for us, it was Henry Slade and James Lightfoot Brown at the time. Um, and I remember coming in from a training session once that he had Henry Slade and Lightfoot Brown cleaning his back because he broke his ankle. So he was sat in, in the shower with his, with his cast up on another chair in the shower like this. Uh, Slade and Lightfoot Brown are washing his back with soap. <laughs> and he's just looking at him going, oh, good little dragon, good little dragon. <laughs> and obviously he has got caught wind of this. Um, and they were known as little dragons from from the, from then yeah, on. We, uh, we, we called it on top. We called, I don't know. I, I told it. Everything merged into one. I'm doing a podcast a day with people at the moment. But this story <laughs> came up the other day, and basically on the tour, on a tour, I don't know where it was, New Zealand or somebody somewhere. Slady lost a bet, and basically the, one of the things was he had to be asked little dragon, right? <laughs> so I, I I was all up for this, right? Not in any, in any like no weird like deviant sexual way. I was like, right, okay. He's like, you're a little dragon. <laughs> you know, you get there for a day cup and tea uh, tea and coffee whenever I want it, uh, carry my bag. And, you know, because I want to bond, you've got to scrub my back in the shower because obviously it's a little little dragon. So when we got off the bus, I took my pocket out, like tea bag from prison break. <laughs> and I put the pocket out and I said, come on, little dragon. And he's like, and it's Slady so loved me. He's like, I'm not doing that. House. He's like, Slady, fucking, hey, take, come on, chief, just take, take, take the pocket. I'm not tired, so take the pocket, right? And so he take the pocket. Obviously, I've then got one of the boys to snap me with a photo. I've then tagged <laughs> Robert Kepner in it from prison break going, saying to him, you know, a good little dragon taking my pocket. Robert Kepner's then replied going to Slady going, See how easy it was, Slady? Always take the pocket, Chief. And, <laughs> and, and then so basically, so it, Slady looked after me the whole day, but I never got round to him scrubbing my back. So, you know, we, we missed out that final little dragon, that little dragon part. Because when you're a bigger unit, you've done too many weights. It's quite actually quite difficult to get the old, the back clean. What you 100%. don't realise is that by being nasty to Slady, he gets the public sympathy and that gives him the public vote. So, yeah. He's <laughs> no, but he was... He got this is the looks. It was being a little dragon's like a thing. Like it was a, I think it was a good thing. You know, it wasn't. You know, I, I was, I was Lowell's little dragon. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you so well. Um, Jack, it's been a, it's been a riot. Thank you very, very much indeed for coming on. Um, yeah, and hopefully we can do this again sometime soon. It not doesn't look like we're going to be doing much else for the foreseeable future. So let's have round two um, when the time comes. Good luck to Zoe. Good luck to um, Nori with the little one coming. Stay Thank well. You. And get back out doing what you um, what you do well before too long. It's been a blast. Um, well, and Hoff, always a pleasure. Never a chore. <laughs> Stay well. Keep smiling. Um, that is it for this week. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening to House of Rugby. Don't forget, you can dig into our entire back catalogue. Uh, that's on podcast or available via YouTube. And you can talk about your favourite shows on the Facebook group as well. 
Don't forget to download Sports Pages, the new interview podcast from iTunes. That's on your podcast app. Thank you once again to Hask. Thank you once again to Jack Noel. What a superstar. See you on Friday for House of Rugby Shorts. We're back next Wednesday with the usual show, the usual guff. Until then, be good, look after yourselves, and stay well. Bye for now. You've been watching the House of Rugby on Joe, together with Guinness. Drink responsibly. Visit drinkaware.co.uk for the facts.